Natural Resources University is pleased to introduce one of our newest series, Working Wild You, hosted by Alex Few and Jared Beaver. When we have a food system that squeezes producers down to the bottom, we just got to get them more breathing room so they can be thoughtful about natural resources. Most people are pretty darn thoughtful when you don't squeeze them down to the bottom line. Welcome back to Working Wild You, a show where we explore what it means to share the working landscape with people and wildlife from the crossroads of culture and science. I'm Jared Beaver. And I'm Alex Few. So, Jared, I'm really excited about our show today because we're going to talk about ranching. Hold up, Alex. Why are we talking about ranching in a season about wolves? Good question, Jared, but let me ask you this. What place do people think of when they think about wolves? Well, to channel my inner Yogi Bear, how about Jellystone National Park, right, boo-boo? Every summer, thousands of pleasure-seeking tourists head for the great outdoor playgrounds of America. And a favorite spot is this wonderland of nature called Jellystone National Park. But while these eager beaver... Yellowstone is home to the most visible and most researched wolves in the world. But actually, 96% of the wolves in the Northern Rockies exist outside of national parks. Did you get that? 96%. I got it. So producers, these folks who raise our food, our fiber, and who steward many of our nation's natural resources, these producers are the ones who actually share the landscape day in and day out with wolves and other wildlife. And oftentimes, ranchers are the ones who bear the cost. Which is why today, we're diving into the economic landscape of ranching so that we can better understand what livestock producers are actually experiencing as they work to sustain their livelihoods alongside wolves. My name's Cole Mannix and I, I'm part of Old Salt Co-op now. You know, my family ranches in the Blackfoot Valley, Western Montana. For a long time, I've just been part of this ongoing conversation about how do you uh, take care of land, employ people, how do we make a living as a family. We met up with Cole in downtown Helena, Montana. When I first met him in 2017, he was hosting a Western Landowners Alliance event in Paradise Valley. It's funny to me that he calls himself now a city kid, because his roots are deep in the Blackfoot Valley. Cole is part of the fifth generation of the Mannix Ranch, and he's now the CEO of Old Salt Co-op. Their mission is to connect customers and producers in a shared purpose, to be stewards. Stewards enhance land, wildlife habitat, and community, just like a pinch of salt in a recipe, just like so many of the voices you'll hear in this podcast, voices of salt of the earth people. Old Salt Co-op connects a growing number of Montana ranches, including the J. Barrell, Mannix Ranch, and Seabin Livestock, with chefs, butchers, and entrepreneurs in an effort to strengthen Montana's food system. Currently, Old Salt has a small outpost serving delicious burgers and fried taters in downtown Helena, but they have big plans to continue expanding the enterprise. They actually just closed the deal on a meat processing facility. The processing facility that we just um, took ownership of is actually right in the city of Helena. And it's a, it's a meat cutting facility, so it's got the capacity to smoke and, and break carcasses and age carcasses and cut and package, but no slaughter. So that's the next hurdle to overcome is where is the slaughter going to take place. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of moving pieces. Cole is steeped in the world of agriculture in a landscape with a long history with wolves. As a kid growing up on the ranch in the Blackfoot Valley, he recalls when he first learned how some of his neighbors felt about wolves. We would carpool down to school and there was a wolf hanging from the stop sign. Somebody had killed a wolf and hung it from the stop sign and it was the same day as the governor's range tour that happened to be in the, on the north end of the valley. So the governor's bus <laughs> passed by this. And it was, this was like reintroduction, I think, was happening in Yellowstone. There had already been wolves moving down through the glacier complex. And, you know, somebody was really unhappy and they made a huge statement. And I think that was the first time I became sort of aware as a freshman or sophomore or something like how deeply 
people felt about the issue. The reintroduction of wolves in Yellowstone and central Idaho was a hot-button issue then and clearly still is now. But Cole believes the picture looks pretty different today in the upper Blackfoot. I no longer think that in the ranching community I came from in the Blackfoot Valley, wolves are seen as a major problem. We can ranch in their presence, and they can do really well in the valley as a population. As long as we continue to just say that it's a, it's a relationship worth maintaining, then we'll continue to have our Blackfoot Challenge meetings, and we'll continue to talk about it as a family. As long as we don't just assume the problem fixes itself, there's not a problem with wolves and ranching where I come from. But providing space for wildlife as a rancher, let's face it, it has inherent costs. And these costs continue to rise with the added variability of climate change. Compound these costs with producers making less profit the average profit margin on livestock operations is now 1.2%. It's no wonder so many working farms and ranches are selling off. How hard are you willing to work for 1.2% profit? Further complicating profit margins, 85% of the beef industry in the U.S. is processed by just four meat packers, and most ranchers only have access to one or maybe two of these companies, meaning the meat processors can essentially set their own prices. I think one of the major shifts came when you basically moved from a grocery store receiving carcasses to a grocery store receiving box beef. There was an efficiency gain for the industry um, in terms of just being able to have net less butchers in grocery stores across the country because it had already been cut at one central place. There's a lot that was lost in that. Cole tells us how both ranchers and consumers are losing out in this deal. First of all, I think a lot of the gains and efficiencies have basically just been kind of pocketed rather than passed on to the customer. And then second of all, I mean, there are so many relationships between the people who buy meat and the butcher who's cutting it. There's so much knowledge lost when you no longer have that exchange as just meat on a plastic tray with saran wrap over it. And this consolidation trend that Cole's talking about in the meat industry has been going on for decades, but things really came to a head in 2020, you know, during the COVID-19 pandemic, when these big four meat packers made windfall profits while charging higher prices to the consumer, but paying less than the cost of raising the animal to the producer. I mean, in 1980, 62 cents of every dollar consumer spent on beef went back to the rancher. Today, it's more like 37 cents. And this economic shift is one reason why so many working lands are disappearing today. In fact, the American West is losing a football field worth of natural area to human development every two and a half minutes. I know in my town, ranchettes are popping up everywhere on what used to be productive farmland, and development is driving up the cost of the land far beyond the value that the land can sustainably provide as a working agricultural operation. Ongoing subdivision and increasing land values are simply outpacing agricultural production, and that has huge implications for our rural communities and the wildlife that depend on these open areas. Many of our neighbors in the Blackfoot Valley would talk differently than our family about, you know, natural resources and, and sustainability. And the we're all over the place politically, right? But at the end of the day, most of those neighbors are just very good stewards of land. I would say, like, it's, it's in people's interest that those ranches stay in business because they give a lot to society by keeping those businesses intact. When we have a food system that squeezes producers down to the bottom, we just got to get them more breathing room so they can be thoughtful about natural resources. Most people are pretty darn thoughtful when you don't squeeze them down to the bottom line. There are so many ranchers, like the Mannix family, that really believe in caring for the land and water. Not just because it supports their livelihoods, but because it supports the wildlife that also needs open space and healthy, connected lands. 
As Aldo Leopold, often called the father of wildlife management, said, conservation will ultimately boil down to rewarding the private landowner who conserves the public interest. And all the producers I talk to, including my own husband, understand that if you take care of the land, it will take care of you. But the costs of operating in highly biodiverse landscapes, where the wolves are, usually aren't accounted for in the price of your burger. You pay the same for a hamburger, whether it comes from a cornfield in Iowa or a pristine mountain range outside of Yellowstone. So producers have to get really creative to be able to ranch in landscapes with so much biodiversity. You could sell your beef directly to consumers, or we can develop alternative models of paying for land stewardship. Let me tell you, I've got three and a half beef left to sell directly to consumers from this season. All of these examples, direct to consumer businesses, co-ops like Old Salt and other enterprises, take a lot of investment for producers. If you don't have a producer who has the, the bandwidth, the stability economically to give thought to these things that they don't sell directly, everything that goes into spongy soil and everything that goes into a good riparian area for fish, if you squeeze them down to just thinking about, I just got to produce it and get it out the door, you're going to lose those intangible values. Intangible values. Cole's talking about wildlife, water quality, open space. Things that these days people are calling ecosystem services. The more you squeeze the producer down to just pure production, it's the difference between a stream where all those inefficiencies are actually where life lives and a canal. And you'll get a canal if, if you just commoditize the food system. One of the things Old Salt is doing is we're really doing our best not to talk about grass-fed or almost any buzzword that you might think about. We're trying to talk about meat with integrity. I don't think there's any way to explain quickly with a buzzword what good land management work looks like. And we do need to like invite people into the more thoughtful version, but it's not a relationship that's going to be built with buzzwords. It's human nature to want to label people as either villains or heroes, to put ourselves into boxes. But in fact, we're all in community together. And community is an essential human need that many of us find woven into the fabric of rural life. That's why I chose to leave big cities behind more than a decade ago. The fact is, so many folks want to do right by the land, the wildlife, and their communities. That's right, and after the break, We'll head to the Gravelly Mountains in southwest Montana, where we'll learn how the Haley family's fourth-generation sheep outfit is working to pay for their stewardship while sharing the land with large predators like wolves and bears. If you're enjoying Working Wild U, consider leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts. We would love to hear from you. And be sure to subscribe to Working Wild U wherever you listen to podcasts. Thanks. Now back to the show. So you going to go check on a herder? Or? Yeah. Talk to him and bring him supplies for the for the week. Yeah. So dog food for the dog, sheep salt, water, groceries for him. Make sure everything's going all right. So you kind of keep everybody going. Right. Yeah, that's kind of my job is just making sure everybody's, you know, safe. They got supplies. They're grazing where they're supposed to be doing all that stuff. So, but no, it's great. It's, a, it's the best job you could have. That's Weston Helly talking with our podcast producer, Zach Altman. He and I were up in the Gravelies on a broad, grassy plateau of a mountain range in southwest Montana visiting father and son, John and Weston Haley, at their summer sheep camp. That's where most of their bands of sheep graze in the summer on a handful of public grazing allotments in the Beaverhead Deer Lodge National Forest. Jared and Zach arrived at camp just as Weston was loading up his truck to resupply the sheep herders scattered across the range. They were kind enough to take a break during their work day to talk with us about their operation. So I'm Weston Helly, um, fourth generation rancher. And I've been kind of full time on the ranch, attending camp here and pretty much all the other jobs that go along with ranching. I'm John Helly. I'm the third generation on this operation. Um, I spent my whole life up here also. We run four bands of sheep up here on the gravelies, have for uh, all of the last 20 years. 
So we're here to learn how the helis are getting creative in order to continue to ranch in a working wild setting. We are owners in the Duckworth Company and we own the supply chain and the full sheep to shelf production of clothing and garments from the sheep all the way to our internet based uh, marketing program where we sell products direct to the consumer. Take the wool from the sheep to the shelf. That's one way the Hellies are working to bring more money back to the ranch. It's a good way to take a product that we produce on the ranch and add value to it and return a consistently higher value to the ranching operation. They tend the sheep all year round, moving them between summer pasture on forest service allotments and their winter grounds on private land in the valley. With sheep herders keeping the sheep tightly grouped together to deter predators, we're talking wolves and grizzlies. Long story short, these sheep get sheared and the wool is then turned into clothing and sold directly to consumers with all phases happening in the United States. And customers love it. It's amazing how well our customers support us. It's just they love the idea, they can get behind it. The new consumer wants to know where their product's coming from, that it's raised sustainably, that it's uh, from hardworking families that, that make the product. John says getting creative with a sustainable sheep operation doesn't mean overnight success, but he definitely recognized the long-term investment of getting a sheep-to-shelf operation off the ground. To start something like that, the upfront capital was pretty substantial. So it was, it was a long-term investment. You know, successful businesses, you have to look at it from the long term and be able to, you know, find the capital and the, and the resources. And we were fortunate enough that we had some resources that we could employ towards that to, to start this company. Keep in mind here that ranching is a full-time plus job. Similar to the challenges for ranchers in the beef industry, sheep operations like the Hellies have a lot of market forces working against them. Trends like the rise of synthetic fibers and wool processing plants closing down in the United States and moving overseas. And let's not forget the rising cost of land in the West. So to make an operation stay in business, producers are having to get creative. And the Hellies are. They also get creative around sharing space with grizzlies and wolves. How do you define the problem of wolves and working lands? H how do you see that? What is the problem? Well, they're just an apex predator that uh, depends on this landscape as we do to survive. For us to be able to let them back into the landscape, we have to learn how to manage our operations so that we can still be sustainable and you know that means economically sustainable also. We asked them how they manage the cost of ranching in a region with so many carnivores. These wolves can be a huge economic issue on operations so we've always had herders with our sheep. Um, when I came back into the operation back in the late 80s we started bringing guard dogs in and and uh, that's been a real success story for us. But not only do the Hellies lose some sheep to wolves, but they lose some guard dogs too. Now it's pretty common that we're losing quite a few guard dogs a year because the packs are, are kind of looking for new territory and growing and kicking out the sub-adults. It's hard to nail down the wolves. Two, three years ago, we lost five dogs in like a week. And plus, uh, I think, Damn. you know, well over 20 sheep kind of within a week. And now, you know, we haven't really had any major big events like that kind of since then. But, you know, we're always just kind of waiting for that to happen. We're hearing a lot of monetary cost here, but the guys also spoke about the emotional stress this can cause. It's stressful though, just, I mean, seeing my guys, they take it personal when they lose just one lamb, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's, I don't know, it's tough. Despite these challenges though, it felt clear to me, sitting there at camp with the Hellies, that they are really passionate about stewarding the land and animals in their care. And they're obviously really inspired by the impact their little companies had locally 
and across the country. Right now, Duckworth employs hundreds of people throughout the country. We're in 19 factories across 11 different states. So, you know, from a local perspective, yeah, we have the ranch and we have a lot of sheep shears and we, we've got a presence all across the country that really is taking a natural resource like the, our private lands and, and the grass that we use up here on the forest and, you know, developing a and growing an actual valuable product, adding value all the way through the, the manufacturing chain, and then that, that product is uh, sold all the way across the United States also. It's amazing how, how much a small little company like Duckworth has an impact, not only locally, but all the way across the United States. But losing sheep and guard dogs? These challenges are not just on the Helles operation. So many of the producers I talk to in my work are dealing with conflicts between wolves and livestock and losing sleep over it. One tool many of these producers are turning to is collaboration. Sitting down with conservation groups, neighbors, and state and federal officials and working together to find solutions. In the Helles neighborhood, there's the Ruby Valley Strategic Alliance. Several ranchers, Rick Sandrew, probably the most in influential on it, were working with some of the NGOs, the GYC, who at, at that time, you know, thought these are our enemies. These are the people that really want to get rid of us and got to sit down with them and talk to them. Participating in the Ruby Valley Strategic Alliance revealed to John that this group of people, ranchers, the Greater Yellowstone Coalition, Trout Unlimited, and others, they all had more in common than they thought. We sat down and, and we all kind of had same, very similar end goals. Just had different ways of thinking that we were gonna get to it. And once we sat down and talked to, you know, we found out that, uh, you know, we got a lot in common and we could deal with these things. And we started, you know, listening to their concerns and what, what they feel is important for the constituents that they represent. And they kind of resonated with us, you know, that that's similar. We want to keep this landscape open and we want to, uh, you know, provide connectivity. And, and, you know, eventually they found out that we're actually the key to it. So let's pause for a moment and address the question. Why are landowners the key in protecting wildlife habitat? My answer is simply that I don't think anyone wants to live in a concrete world. And working landscapes are absolutely critical to sustaining both people and wildlife. The less economically sustainable working landscapes are, the more likely we are to lose them to development. And from a biological perspective, we need these working lands. They serve as the glue that keeps wildlife populations connected so that they can maintain their genetic resilience and thrive. This is difficult to have the type of landscape and habitat required for these large animals to, uh, you know, thrive and be able to be a successful population. So, you know, with all the tools in the toolbox from compensation to maybe conservation payments um, to, you know, lethal removal when you have to. And especially the Greater Yellowstone Coalition has been, you know, helpful in, in helping us you know, get the grants and the money to put together programs to bring in more wildlife services agents and non-lethal agents and, and those that really help us, you know, identify where our issues are with, with uh, predation and how to get verification quicker and that type of stuff. So it makes sense then to work together and keep working lands working while doing right by the people, the land, and the wildlife. Because if we can't, chances are when they sell the land these days, it'll be subdivided and developed, meaning that critical productive habitat will be lost. And that's not new. That's happening right now all over the West. And Weston shared an outcome of the Ruby Valley Strategic Alliance that has really helped the Hellies, getting more people out on the land. 
The Ruby Valley Strategic Alliance worked to obtain funding to support more wildlife services agents. Folks are authorized to trap and remove wolves that have developed a habit of preying on livestock. These professional agents are the ones that come out to investigate whether or not a wolf killed livestock. And that allows ranchers to be compensated when kills are confirmed. Yeah, no, that program's been been really helpful. Before before we had those extra agents, it was pretty rare that I'd see our trapper. While many in the Ruby are working together to make progress, they still face challenges when it comes to sharing the landscape with wolves. The missing piece of the puzzle to making it all work? Well, from the Heli's point of view, public understanding. Um, we're living with them. We're working around them. It's, it's caused a lot of heartache and a lot of expense on our operation. And I, I just feel like the public, if, if, they, if that's important to the public, then those of us that bear that cost need to be recognized for the cost that we're bearing on it. A lot of people just, it doesn't click to them that the ranchers are what's keeping this open space. They drive through Montana and say, wow, this is beautiful, you know. They just don't realize that having ranches in business is what keeps it open. Probably a lot easier before we had wolves, but where we're at now, we have them. It's just the way it is. So getting the public to realize that, you know, we're the ones dealing with them. And whether it's, you know, compensation programs or conservation payments or my ability to feel like they, they understand our problem and that they know that it costs us money and they're sympathetic to us being here and realize that what we're providing in the form of conservation practices and open space and corridors and our ranches provide is, is important to the whole program also. What we just heard John talk about is a concept called compensation, and it's one of what I call the four C's. That's compensation, conflict prevention, control, and collaboration. And we just heard John and Weston talk about how compensation needs to be equitable. With widely valued wildlife like wolves and grizzly bears, the cost of providing habitat for these highly mobile species should be shared by society. And John also talked about conflict prevention. These are tools like the guard dogs and the herders he told you and Zach about that are designed to deter wildlife. And producers need funding to give them the time and resources to find what works within their individual operations and landscapes. That's right. And the third C, control, that means lethal control, is a critical tool that supports conflict prevention and does not undermine it. So let's be clear here. Solutions for conflict on working lands require that all tools are in the toolbox. John also spoke to the value of collaboration. It's key. Solutions go nowhere when the people who must implement them are left out of the planning process. This four C's framework keeps people, as Cole would put it, from being squeezed to the bottom. And this approach leaves room to adapt the four C solutions to the social, economic, and ecological conditions unique to each community across the West. And when all four C's are available, we can build stronger partnerships, more resilient ranches, and ultimately, better connected landscapes that sustain the culture of the West, including its people and its wildlife. Some might say that could be a shared vision. So based on what we've heard here today from Cola and the Hellies, Let's see if we can answer the question from the top of the show. Who pays the cost of maintaining biodiversity on the landscape? Right now, the producers do. Conservation cannot come at the expense of making daily life unlivable. So we have to create the conditions that make conservation and a good living go hand in hand. In our next episode, We'll talk about how these economic considerations intersect with policy. Specifically, the Endangered Species Act. So buckle up. Next episode will be a good one. Working Wild U is a production of Montana State University Extension and Western Landowners Alliance with support from the Arthur M. Blank Family Foundation, Western SARE, and listeners like you. Today's episode was directed and edited by Zach Altman. 
and produced by Matthew Collins, Zach Altman, Alex Few, Jared Beaver, and Abby Nelson. Our hosts are Jared Beaver and Alex Few. Lewis Wirtz is our executive producer. Music is from Artlist and Blue Dot Sessions. Special thanks to Cole Mannix, John and Weston Helly, and Nick Mott. Follow Working Wild U on social media for updates and explore our show notes and bonus content on our website at workingwild.us. Please consider rating and reviewing the show on Apple Podcasts and share this episode with a friend or neighbor. Thank you, and we'll see you next time.